reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. David, uh, you and I have been in this business a long time, and uh, I don't know about you, and of course you're much more of an expert than I am in this whole field of monetary macroeconomics, but at least on the basis of, of my observation, I don't think I've ever lived in a period when there's quite so much confusion uh, as there is now amongst our colleagues in economics and also amongst the general discussion uh, about the state of macroeconomics because it seemed to me it, back uh, when we were starting out the the Keynesians had all the answers they could fine-tune the economy with fiscal policy and then for a period there it seemed like that uh, their ideas were were bankrupt and so then it came along that we were, well, as long as we kept the money supply growing properly we had the monitors coming in and then we got the great inflation of this of, of the 70s and, and early 80s and and uh, things kind of fell apart at the, at, the, at the level of analytical ideas. And it seems to me now that we're, we have macroeconomists who more or less admit they don't know anything. We don't have any models that are acceptable. And <coughs> the politicians are mouthing um, theories that uh, they don't have any basis for in ideas at all. And the media picks that up. It seems to me just a, a jumble of confusion as compared to the early years of our career. I just wonder what your reactions are generally to that. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more about the confusion. The mere fact that we've had the, uh, the tightest monetary policy in over 40 years, and yet hardly anyone points this out. You don't find a mention of it in the press and the media. In fact, it's generally viewed that the Federal Reserve has followed an expansionary policy because there have been 24 cuts in the federal funds rate, and very few people point out that the Fed followed the market down rather than leading it down. So that in itself is a remarkable confusion. I think the mere fact that there's such wide unanimity that the Fed has done an outstanding job when the economy is in such bad shape, that itself should make one wonder. Now it's also true that uh, five Nobel economists, including yourself, have criticized the Fed, including people like Milton Friedman and Tobin and Samuelson. But that, that is not even, that's not considered worthy of attention. And uh, I'm reminded of the fact that in ancient uh, Hebrew law, uh, every capital case had to go to the Sanhedrin. There were 70. And the rule there was that if all 70 said guilty, the man was innocent. The theory was that if among 70, <laughs> one couldn't find yeah. an extenuating circumstance, it probably wasn't getting a fair hearing. Yeah. I would apply that here. Yeah. When you get such wide unanimity yeah. that the Fed has done an outstanding job, I yeah. think there's reason to, to wonder what's going on here. Yeah. Well, well, you do concentrate uh, your, your remarks or your response generally on the, on the Fed, the Federal Reserve Board. And I think that's worth, uh, that's worth concentrating on. I share your, your general uh, view. And, and it is amazing to me how the Fed over the years has, has done such a terrible job and how it's escaped uh, public criticism and, and basically political criticism. You find a few congressmen who, who criticize the Federal Reserve Board for its particular policies now and then, but you don't find anybody sort of trying to re-examine the structure. And it, it, actually, historically, it's a very strange structure. As you know, they, they felt something was needed in the, in the early part of the century, so they set up a big commission, and after several years of study, they then enacted the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, or whenever it was. And, uh, th but that was simply to sort of alleviate credit crunches um, under the operation of an international gold standard. And then we gradually, in, in the 30s, uh, partially went off the gold standard, and then finally totally went off in, in 71. As a result, the Fed more or less just inherited this legacy of being a monopoly in control of our monetary institutions. It does, it's not a constitutional body. It has never been explicitly examined legislatively, and yet it gets away with, with all this without any criticism, because the criticism is always on the 
uh, on the on the Congress or the <coughs> president or on the uh, the evil machinations of the uh, of the of the gnomes of Zurich or something. They don't concentrate on on the where the problem uh, really originates. And certainly, the we now know from the economic histories that have been written about the 30s, that the, the Great Depression of the 30s was basically uh, caused by the Federal Reserve's failure uh, to shore up the, the monetary system. And we know the Great Inflation uh, in the 70s was caused by that. We know the, the recession and, and, and uh, slow recovery from, from 89 forward was caused by that. Uh, and yet, how does the Fed insulate itself from public criticism? That's a mystery. I think that's, you might say, the eighth mystery of the world. <laughs> the, uh, not only do they insulate themselves, but let me just add to what you said. After each disaster, they end up with a lot more power. For example, after the Great Depression, they get the Banking Act of 35, which increased their power enormously. After the Great Inflation, they get the Monetary Control Act of 1980, again. So not only do they foul up, but in, after the foul up, they end up with more turf, more power, and more and more control, so as to make sure it doesn't happen again. So you have a, an extraordinary situation where they almost have an incentive to foul up, because after each foul up, they're considered to be the best body to to get the yeah, power to make yeah, sure it doesn't yeah, happen. Yeah. So I, I think it is a mystery. It requires some deep analysis as to why an institution seems to continuously being rewarded for its failure. Yeah, and you get, you know, public pronouncements but back when Arthur Burns was chairman and Paul Volcker was chairman and now Alan Greenspan was chairman of the Fed. You get uh, Time Magazine and others uh, reporting that second most powerful man uh, right. in, in the world, you know, type right. of thing. And, right. uh, and yet this is just sort of exists out there without any sort of political underpinning and, and what's more important, no political criticism. Now you do find, as I said, you find occasionally uh, uh, some congressmen and chairman of committees will, will call them up and they'll testify, but there's no interest whatsoever in, in, uh, in this underlying uh, questioning. Right. I think that's a very important question, it's certainly deserving of more attention. And in addition, I also add another point that in the academy, you find very little criticism, and either because some of the uh, some of the younger, uh, bright ac academicians have decided that to go into real business cycle theory, mm -hmm. which, in essence, says that policy doesn't matter, mm -hmm. or they go into rational expectations, and again, uh, so you have uh, it's a very strange situation. Some of these people have a theory in which the Fed really doesn't matter, but they never ask themselves, mm -hmm. if so, why don't they conclude that we should abolish it mm -hmm. if it doesn't matter? I, mm -hmm. I really don't understand. I think it's really a, a question worthy of further study. It's a mystery. Yeah, you see, I, I think it, um, uh, go, mention, you mentioned the real business cycle theory and a lot of things that's been uh, talked about uh, within recent years. Somehow the idea is, uh, as I goes back to my first comment, that we've abandoned theory in a way. Uh, the idea is that, that the economy is kind of subject to the uh, uh, plays of fortune. That is, uh, you can have a shock and it can have an effect, or this another shock can have an effect. You're just floating around. Now, uh, I've been accused of being a monetarist, and you even more of being a monetarist. And uh, my response always is, I'm a monetarist in the sense that nobody can convince me that a, a free enterprise capitalistic system has to be subject to these shocks. Uh, I think that if you can trace the causes of economy-wide recessions or economy-wide inflations, they're always basically monetary causes. And the function of the central bank or the government should be to provide a stable monetary framework, uh, a monetary fiscal framework. But uh, And we've never done that, and, and uh, we've never sort of centered in on trying to see what would be required institutionally to provide that. Instead, we just give up and say, well, uh, money's going to, you know, it doesn't have, as you say, policies ineffective, we're just subject to these shocks. I, re I sort of refuse to acknowledge that. I'm an old-fashioned monetarist in that sense without being a monetarist in, in detail. Well, I agree with you. I think you might say that the uh, the academic world is in a kind of a bankruptcy right now. There's been hardly any criticism. Here we have uh, three, four years of very sluggish growth. Uh, 
at the American Economic Association annual meeting, there was a discussion of what what happened. That was in 93. In 1993, and you had very able people, and, and one thought there might have been a consumer shock, although he couldn't specify what it was, that caused this slowdown. Another thought it was a techno technological shock, and a third thought it was a combination of shocks which he couldn't specify. Now here you have an amazing thing. We have the economy is in very bad shape for three years, very sluggish growth, three very able people at the forefront of the profession and they really have nothing to say. Mm -hmm. I think that in itself is worthy of investigation. Yeah, well, we've raised more problems, I suspect, than, than we've answered here, but um, I, I do think that we need somehow to, if we could force a political uh, awareness, uh, a political awareness of the fact that we have this rather jerry-built institutional structure of the Federal Reserve, which is more or less evolved without any sort of guidelines, without any policy direction. Uh, really, it's, as I've said, uh, quasi-seriously in, in talks that I have given that um, uh, what happens to the economy depends on what Alan Greenspan and his colleagues have for breakfast. It's, it's almost that bad in the sense that uh, it's just discretionary policy, and if you're thinking now about the criterion for good, uh, stable monetary parameters, it would be predictability. You need predictability, and uh, how can you possibly predict uh, what the Federal Reserve Board is going to do or the Open Market Committee is going to do? There's no predictability in the system at all. You couldn't imagine a worse system than we have, it seems to me. Now, we might disagree, you and I might disagree with others, and we might have a, a, a debate about whether we want to uh, try to go back to some kind of a commodity-based money, a gold standard, or, or commodity bundle, or whether some sort of a monetary rule, or whether an Irving Fisher scheme for stabilizing the value of the dollar. Uh, there might be disagreement about that, but at least what we ought to be doing as, as political economists and as um, political leaders ought to be doing it, as intellectuals ought to be doing it, media people ought to be doing it. We ought to be sitting around a table to talking about alternatives to the structure, the fundamental structure that we have in, in our monetary institutions, and we're not doing that. We find very, very little of that going on. And uh, absolutely correct, and very little, hardly anybody is willing to talk about that. And I would, I would elaborate on something you said, that we don't know what the uh, Federal Reserve is doing. I would go further and say they don't know what they're doing. In other words, they meet once a month and set policy. When they meet, there's, there's something, there's some fire that they imagine is going on, yeah, and they yeah. visualize their main function as getting rid of that fire. Yeah. So when you say, does Greenspan know what yeah. he's going to do? I yeah. really don't. I think if we could somehow x-ray his mind, we would find that he doesn't know what he's yeah. going to do next yeah. month. It depends what he thinks is going to be his biggest yeah. political yeah. fire. Yeah. I think that's a very bad system yeah. where the policymakers themselves don't know what their yeah. policy yeah. is. Yeah. I think Axel Leonhoof had once talked about that as a random walk theory. That is, they're just, as you say, they're, they're responding to what the particulars they, of the situation in the short term at that particular time. They don't have any sort of structure, and, and they couldn't have given the way they're, they're, the way they're set up and the, their, their, their sort of uh, legislative, uh, legislative authority. Um, and then we come back to what we said earlier, and that is the, the mystery as to why it is so difficult to get generalized public discussion about this. Um, we're always talking about the, 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 the current particulars of policy and not talking about structure. How do we get a, a, a discussion of, of changing the structure? Well, I think that the, uh, we may get to a point where more people m will begin to wonder. I think the, uh, the Federal Reserve had a very easy ride in the 1993 period. Uh, there was hardly a word of criticism. And yet, in, in if, you look at it in after, if you look at the facts, there's a lot to criticize. I think, you know, in time, more people will begin to wonder about the question you began, which mm -hmm. is, why is it that an institution that has, on the whole, had a very mediocre performance mm -hmm. has such extraordinary standing? Mm -hmm. I think that is also a question mm -hmm. that more people will begin to wonder about.
And I think it does require, maybe, to bring this to public attention. It requires, first of all, probably leadership at several levels. It might require some intellectual leadership, some people who are in the academy uh, but uh, to, to take the front, but also some political leadership, some, some uh, politician who find that to make that his cause. Right. In the academy itself, I think it's, uh, there's a, there's a uh, I know you've talked about this, uh, there's some incestuous behavior going on that's a little bit worrisome here. The Fed, in a sense, co-ops a lot of the academicians who might be specialists in this field by, by hiring them on as consultants and uh, giving them grants and so forth. Uh, that's going to make it difficult for intellectual leadership who is both informed and competent to come in and and, and make a, a, a massive criticism. Now, Milton Friedman has done that to some extent, and he, he holds a position that he can do that, but there aren't that many Milton Friedmans around. Uh, and so um, maybe the, the way it's going to happen is some um, budding political uh, leader is going to see that uh, that's a, a place that's vulnerable to, to real criticism. Yes, uh, for example, just to uh, spell out what you just said, yeah. Uh, yeah. here we have five of the most distinguished economists, very critical about the Fed in the 1993 period, yeah. and yet hardly at the American Economic Association meeting there was hardly a word of criticism. Yeah. A remarkable paradox. Yeah. One might say that people over 65 can't think, or you might say people under 40 have a strong incentive not to think too critically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not to think too critically about the fundamental or foundational aspects of the problem. It seems to me this is not only true about monetary policy, but it's also true about a lot of things. It seems to me that a lot of our uh, younger peers in the profession, um, they really spend a lot of time um, worrying about very complex issues, and they're very competent people. They're very analytically extremely bright. But they, they sort of bypass thinking about the fundamentals, the foundational aspects. So we're talking about these foundational aspects here. Yeah, we're talking yeah, sort of yeah. what is right and what is wrong. And uh, in the uh, professions, there's a greater incentive to produce a lot of pyrotechnics about particular methods and procedures. Yeah. And so there's a tendency to stay away from what is a correct policy, yeah. incorrect. And uh, often it's frowned upon uh, because... Uh, there's, uh, that's not what people expect you to do when you're young. Yeah. Well, that may be true. That may be true. I don't know. But anyway, um, I would like to see a, you know, a real reassessment. I would like to see the, uh, an administration and a Congress come in and set up another commission or something to really look at the authority of the, of the, Federal, Reserve, of the Federal Reserve system. Um, there, there's tremendous value in trying to get the monetary parameters of our system in some sort of order. And, and yet, it seems to me, just increasing disorder. And I haven't ever observed a period in which we, the potential disorder is as great as now. Um, maybe it was like this in the, in the 30s when I was high school and can't remember, but uh, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's clear that uh, certainly if Carter Glass yeah. Uh, was alive today, he would recognize yeah. what allegedly was his, yeah. was his something creation. He, his creation. Yeah. And in fact, I don't think he was a, even able to recognize what it was after 1935. Yeah. Yeah. But it really is an amazing yeah. thing. Yeah. It's grown like Topsy. It's got enormous powers, and yet hardly, it, hardly yeah. anyone has sat down uh, yeah. to really consider whether it all adds up. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Well, you've heard me tell the story about my only real. Uh, relationship uh, to the Reagan administration was not with the administration at all, but uh, immediately after the election of Reagan, um, some of his uh, um, assistants wrote around, what could he do in the first hundred days? And I wrote back and said, um, uh, what I would like to see would be a, a presidential uh, committee or commission set up to look at the authority of the Federal Reserve Board. And over the Christmas before Reagan came in, uh, they called me up, the so-called kitchen cabinet called me up and they said, they're very interested in this idea. Uh, would I be willing to chair such a commission and who I might get? And so I made a lot of calls around and had something sort of set up and I was very excited. Wrote a two-page thing in which I, Reagan could read out and so forth, establishing this thing. And never heard another word, never another word. 
uh, Reagan was inaugurated and so forth. Then I found out two months later that it did come up in the discussions in Los Angeles in the kitchen cabinet before Reagan came in and Arthur Burns just absolutely <laughs> kiboshed the, <laughs> the whole idea because Arthur Burns, even though he was no longer chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, was determined to preserve this autonomy. Nobody, well, it was not even legitimate to question the authority of the Federal Reserve Board. So that's the situation we're in, we've been in. Uh, and, and somehow we've got to break that shell. We've got to break that, uh, that monopoly of discussion or that uh, sort of closed off. Um, so it's a kind of a sacrosanct institution. Uh, your mention of Arthur Burns <clears throat> brings up something that I just recently learned. Yeah. That, uh, you know, right today the Fed fights very hard to get lots of regulatory powers. Yeah. That was not in the original act. Yeah. And uh, probably the greatest regulatory imperialist of all was Arthur Burns. Yeah. He was always trying to get the power of the Fed extended to more and more areas. Yeah. And it's not at all clear that the regulator should be the monetary authority. Yeah. Well, I know there have been arguments that they should, uh, they should separate, uh, separate these things out. Well, I think uh, um, we've covered a lot of these, uh, a lot of these areas, and uh, I, don't, I don't think that you and I are going to provide. Uh, well, I wanted uh, to add one uh, yeah, one thing yeah. that the uh, <clears throat> that you know, manage money <clears throat> is a relatively you might think of it it's a very young child. Mm. It's a creation of the twentieth century. Yeah. And it could very well be that in the fullness of time, we'll say it sounded like a good idea when it was brought yeah, in, yeah. but maybe it wasn't such yeah, a good idea. Yeah, in yeah. other words, I think looking at managed money in, in 1990, in the, at the end yeah, of, the, of yeah. the 20th century, it looks far different than it looked, say, 20, 30 yeah, years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we may decide that some of the institutions which we frown upon yeah. may come back maybe in a slightly yeah, revised yeah, form. Yeah. Well, that's a kind of an optimistic note, and uh, in a sense, you're saying that maybe there's hope in the sense that we are going to really re-examine these things and 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 uh, certainly look at that period in which we we didn't have the idea that the government can lay a hands on that it needs to provide just these monetary parameters. So I, I think that that may be a good way to end this uh, general. Well, discussion. it's at least a good way to think. Right. <laughs> right. It's hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>